So if you can turn your cameras off. Hello and welcome. Welcome to this HPP webinar series. We're delighted to have you here. We're um, just getting started. We have 183 people joining us from across the province, Alberta, federal government, um, people from the ministry, people from the uh, business community, not-for-profits, and uh, academics joining us today. So we're very delighted that we have a large audience um, and able to share with you um, this exciting project, New Tools to Build Social Connection in Multi-Unit Housing. Um, this photo that I've chosen here is a little bit like uh, someone said, it referred to it as a dollhouse, but basically it's the people um, and the social connections that we are really encouraging uh, different places, spaces. For me and where I am in a condo, it's the laundry room, you know, who would guess? That's where we gather, but there's also other places like the bike room and we have conversations. And so it's really exciting uh, that the North Vancouver, city of North Vancouver has chosen a grant application and this topic to bring together um, as BC looks to ramp up our housing supply, the planners from six Metro Vancouver jurisdictions work together on new policy levers and a public toolkit coming soon in June. So stay tuned. We'll send that out in a newsletter as well as situated on the websites. Um, I am Dr. Connie Alsop, Plan H delivery lead, Please add your names, roles, and a land acknowledgements in the chats, and we will get started in just a moment. Today, our case study features Plan H 2023 grant. In the next 60 minutes, we'll feature three speakers and four panelists who are keen to share the lessons learned from their projects along with this toolkit that will be coming First up, we have Michelle Hoare uh, from Hey Neighbor Collective. Madeline, uh, can you go back, Monica? Thanks. Uh, Madeline from Hey Happy Cities. And from our business sector, Carla, founder and CEO of Purpose Driven Development. And a special guest specifically joining us for the Q&A today is the city of North Vancouver's mayor, Linda Buchanan. So we're very delighted to have them all joining us uh, as they situate themselves uh, during their talks a little bit more. Uh, we've put it in on the website so you can go back and have a look as well. Uh, but it, it's really a, an amazing group of women coming together to share uh, some solutions that they found in housing. So I'll move into the land acknowledgement. If you can continue to add your names and roles and chat land acknowledgement. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the land, the organization I represent, represent operates on the unceded Lekwungen territory. I want to acknowledge the past and present impacts that colonialism has had on Indigenous people's health and well being, and remind ourselves that the Canadian housing system we're going to speak about today is a manifestation of this continued colonialism. So, just a little bit about BC Healthy Communities and Plan H. But before that, we'll do housekeeping. Sorry, Monica, thanks for that. Uh, housekeeping, you can post your questions in the Q&A and we have 20 minutes set aside at the end to do that Q&A for you with all of it. Uh, just so you know ahead of time that the session is being recorded and there's a survey link that's going to pop up in the chat as well as at the end for you to complete while the webinar is going on. But we really love to hear from you. And your questions, if we can't get to them, you can post them in the survey and we'll be happy to send that out in about three to four weeks. So again, the project today is featuring a Plan H community. BC Healthy Communities is a group of team of planners, health specialists, community engagement practitioners operating at the intersection of planning and healthcare. 
We are a province-wide not-for-profit facilitating the ongoing development of communities where it's easier for people to live healthy and well. Plan H specifically supports local government engagement and partnerships across all sectors by creating healthier communities. We have uh, grants that we give out uh, on healthy public policy and community connections. And so really encouraging the Ministry of Health to support the promotion of health strategies across the province in all of our BC communities. This year, Plan H has about 34 communities that is, uh, we're serving with grants across the province. And so it's really delighted to shine a, a flashlight on one of ours that has chosen the housing topic. Um, I was had the pleasure of attending two of the four sessions that they hosted with up to about 80 people. And during our Q&A, you'll hear a little bit more about that specifically from uh, North Vancouver. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our three speakers. Um, to go into today's intention, we have, Monica, can you go back? Thanks. Today, our intention is to learn how to increase social equity and connection in multi-unit residential buildings, specifically through the design. And, and we were in those conversations in Vancouver talking about how we can get into having specific design features. Um, also for the inclusive social design, to preserve um, affordability and how that can be balanced. I think it's a fine balance. And also the policy tools that maybe need to be developed. So moving along to our next slide, Monica, thank you. This is the uh, visual that we had from North Vancouver for co-housing. And so it's a very exciting uh, project that really in terms of looking deeper into it, Madeline and Michelle will go into that and share their research and their survey and assessment that's happened over a number of years, but today we'll have the sneak preview of the last uh, bits that they've uh, put together with this project over the last year. So I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you very much, Connie. Uh, really uh, quite an honor to be asked to speak by uh, BC Healthy Communities and uh, and just wanna thank your organization for supporting this work as well through, uh, through the Plan H grant. So my name is Michelle Hort. I'm the project director for the Hay Neighbor Collective. Um, Monica, if you could advance the slide. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Hay Neighbor Collective in a minute, but um, I guess for starters, I'm um, based in Vancouver. So the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil uh, peoples. Very, feel very fortunate to, uh, to be here on this land. Um, but I'm going to go way back to the to the foundation of all of this, which is the importance of uh, social connections to our health and well-being. So Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstadt is a very um, extremely well-known uh, researcher internationally based in the States, um, who for years has been studying the impacts of chronic loneliness and social isolation. And um, she's quite famous for doing uh, meta studies, so pulling together international studies and looking at, you know, what are the, you know, what are the conclusive findings from all of them. And really what she said during the pandemic was that fundamentally being socially connected in meaningful ways is, is fundamental, it's key to our human health and survival. Um, and, you know, one of the other facts that she's quite famous for is for showing that chronic loneliness and isolation is as damaging to our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and increases our risk of premature death by as much as 50 percent. So, of course, these impacts can, you know, um, you know, are kind of across time across your life. So uh, there can you people can be lonely at any stage in their life. You know, there's there's quite a rise in loneliness and isolation in young people right now, unfortunately. But as we age and other factors complicate, um, this becomes a bigger and bigger problem um, and can can lead to really significant uh, issues in in uh, in later life. And then conversely, strong social supports are protective for physical and mental health and uh, protective against cognitive decline um, and other you know negative health impacts. To Monica, if we can advance. So at Hey Neighbor Collective, we're particularly interested in um, neighborly social connections. And, you know, during the pandemic and um, extreme heat events on the West Coast, we really, really, really saw why it was important to know your neighbors. So it's good to have 
social connections of any type with family, friends, people in, you know, at work and faith communities. But if we don't know our neighbors, um, we can kind of be in big trouble when, when there are crises. And if we do, if we are connected and we trust our neighbors and we have relationships there, we weather um, all the, you know, the small and big storms uh, of life much better. Um, so for, again, for any age group, um, you know, people from any backgrounds, there are significant um, physical and mental well-being impacts from connectedness, um, but also um, stronger ability for us as communities to weather things um, and to be more engaged and active in, in creating strong, vibrant communities. So next slide, please. So Hey Neighbor Collective has been around since 2019. We originally started in 2018 as a City of Vancouver pilot project. Um, I was on the advisory committee along with a number of other people, um, but it transitioned into leaving the city and finding a home at the SFU um, Center for Dialogue. And now we are what's called a collective impact project made up of a whole range of organizations, including housing operators, um, NGOs, local governments, regional governments, research um, organizations from SFU and also Happy Cities, um, and public health organizations like Vancouver Health. And our long-term vision is of a future where more of Canada's multi-unit housing communities are socially connected, age-friendly, neighborly, health-promoting, and resilient. In December 2020, we um, responded to the consultation process around our regional growth strategy with a discussion paper that we called social equity social connectedness and multi-unit housing in an age of public health and health, public health and climate crises so pretty pretty big topic um, but really honing in on what can we do in multi-unit housing to meet this moment that we're in where we're dealing with climate crises health crises um, you know all sorts of crises including loneliness and isolation um, and so we came up with six recommendations for both um, Metro Vancouver, but also uh, the constituent um, jurisdictions. And one of them that was really well received as something to get started on right away was fostering design education and dialogue around uh, how, how to best design multi-unit housing so that it intentionally fosters social connectedness. Um, we followed that up in uh, September 2021 and June 2022 with um, in-person workshops with a wide range of people, um, you know, kind of representing our collective, but beyond formal partners. And we heard a really, really good quote from um, an architect who said that essentially the desire for socially connected, cohesive communities is included in all broad community plans. There is no city that says it wants to be an unfriendly, not diverse, not vibrant, not trusting, not belonging place. Everybody says they want to be these things, but the visions often get filtered out as, as you build and develop land because it's not mandated in actual development processes. I see Madeline coming on, which means I need to speed up. Uh, so in February 2023, Metro 2050, the regional growth strategy was passed. And in it is a little nugget that says that all 21 member jurisdictions need to show how their policies and actions will um, help to increase social connectedness and multi-unit housing. So that's been a really uh, important policy window for us to engage with local jurisdictions, which we've been doing for the past year. So Madeline will tell you a little bit more about the work with um, the city of North Vancouver in particular, but we brought together the city of Burnaby, New Westminster, North Vancouver, Surrey, Vancouver, and Sawasan First Nation together across four full day workshops to co-create policy around um, sociably designed, age-friendly, inclusive housing. Um, and now we've wrapped those workshops up and we're now into phase three, which is starting to build a, um, a toolkit around that. And I think this is where I pass it over to Madeline. Thanks, Michelle. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here um, among, with all of you to be sharing our work. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, I work with Happy Cities. We're a planning and consulting and research firm uh, based in Vancouver. And uh, through my work with Happy Cities, I mostly work on housing. So I have the privilege of understanding housing from many different perspectives, um, from architecture and design, which is my background, to policy, to development and finances, and more importantly, to the experiences of people um, actually living in buildings. So one of the main themes that has come up through all of our work and engagement um, is that really that, that teams that set out to intentionally build connections um, tend to be the most successful in nurturing community bonds. Uh, next slide. Um, 
So really the key is we're trying to build these intentional communities. And this can be done through programming, through design, or through policy. Um, strong communities where residents support each other have a lot of benefits, as Michelle mentioned. And they can help save us time in our busy lives, whether it's having a friend right at your doorstep or sharing uh, tasks with neighbors. They help people age in place longer, saving them money and potentially reducing pressure on other housing forms like long-term care. They can help reduce our expenses. Um, we see neighbors sharing cars, sharing food, um, sharing childcare. And you know, as mentioned by Michelle, the really important piece is that during emergencies like pandemics or heat waves, these neighbors really support each other. They come through for each other and we see much better outcomes um, for people who have these support networks right at their doorstep. Um, and of course, affordability, uh, housing choice, and security tenure is really core to our work. So if those things aren't met, um, it's incredibly difficult to actually thrive and build these social networks that we're talking about. Um, and this is our simple kind of spectrum of neighborly social interactions. The important thing to note is that all these types of interactions are really important for our health and well-being from the kind of casual encounters that we have um, in our neighborhoods and in our buildings to the really mutually supportive relationships that can come from neighbors or family or friends. Um, so if you think about it this way, the, the design of a building can really help us connect with neighbors by enabling those casual encounters. Um, so if you don't bump into anyone, you are unlikely to form a relationship with them. Um, so if we place design elements strategically in the building, Suddenly we have opportunities to say hello to a neighbor or have our kids play together or have our pets meet each other, um, all of these good things. And over time, as these encounters grow and we, we live longer in our communities, these things can actually form into deeper relationships and friendships. Um, one thing we talk about is programming, um, like you see in co-housing, for example, can really help accelerate these relationships. So as we actually do things together, we spend more time together. Um, we build those mutually supportive relationships. And mutual support does take a long time to build, um, but it is something that can be really protective um, for our social well-being. Um, so we're very grateful to have partnered with the City of North Vancouver to act, assess their active design guidelines. Um, it's so important for municipalities to take stock of the impact of their policy. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we did. Um, first of all, the City of North Vancouver adopted the Active Design Guidelines uh, way back in 2016. So the goal was to encourage physical activity and social interaction through design of multi-unit housing. Um, and the policy incentivizes developers looking at the six key areas of the built environment. So I encourage you to check out the policy, uh, which was just linked in the chat. Um, so how did we actually evaluate this policy? So we, we pulled out a lot of our different research tools um, and we worked in partnership with Simon Fraser University to collect the data throughout 2023. Um, so first of all, we used um, an auditing tool that we've been developing for several years that has over 120 considerations about how the built environment supports well-being, connection, inclusion, accessibility, safety, and more. Um, so in order to do that, our research students from SFU um, accessed the buildings and, and walked through and did observations, kind of filled out our checklist. Um, we also conducted a survey that was open to anyone in North Vancouver who lives in multi-unit housing, and we heard from just over 600 residents. And finally, we also had a focus group in North Vancouver at the Public Library to talk more in depth about you know, social connection in our housing. Um, and we did interviews with developers, architects, property managers, and city planners who had actually worked with the policy. Um, and these are some of the social connection numbers that came out from our survey. So one thing that's interesting to note is that people seemed more connected and more familiar with their neighbors in North Vancouver than in the wider uh, Metro Vancouver region, which is interesting. Um, of course, there's many demographic factors that impact our social networks like age, gender, income level, housing tenure type, and more. Um, so the interesting kind of results here is that about 12% of those surveyed didn't know any of their neighbors. Um, and 17% reported feeling lonely, um, always lonely, and off, uh, always or often lonely. Um, and we've seen these numbers really increase after the pandemic. Um, we also learned more about where people are actually interacting with their neighbors in their buildings. 
So we found that the majority of the interactions are actually happening in these transitional spaces like hallways, corridors, lobbies, um, and the kind of zone just outside the front of our building. Um, so this is really important to think about, uh, you know, beyond traditional amenity spaces like lounges or courtyards, um, these, these connecting spaces are, are literally connecting spaces. Um, so it's so, so important to think about circulation of the building when we're designing. Um, and uh, these were some of the buildings that uh, great, graciously allowed us to access the building and actually do the audits. Um, so you can read more in, in the public report. Um, and then finally, I want to just share some design principles that we found um, through all of th this work that we were able to do, um, talking to residents, looking at actual buildings, and to see how these buildings are actually designed. Um, so we designed six, we identified six common design principles um, across buildings that helped foster community, community. So they're location, interaction, activation, inclusion, transition, and evolution. Um, and you'll see these principles emerging in our toolkit as you know the, the key pieces to think about when we're designing spaces um, for people to actually use and enjoy and build social connections in. Um, so I'll give you a little bit a uh, quick overview of all of them. Um, I don't have much time. Um, and also show you some examples from the North Vancouver study. Um, so location. This one is pretty easy. Um, of course, like people use what they can see. So if we locate these common spaces um, in a prominent location where they're easily visible, people are more likely to use them. Um, and we can create more activity by co-locating these spaces together. Um, so this is a really great example from a Keyside Village co-housing. Um, they've designed their, their community very intentionally. So they have this lobby with this beautiful seating area. Um, to the left is their common house, their laundry room. So all of their social spaces are there. To the right is their courtyard. Um, through this kind of very intentional design, they've created a really interesting um, social community uh, at their building. Um, interaction. So as I, if you think back to the, the neighborly connection spectrum, we really want to maximize the potential of those daily spontaneous interactions with neighbors. Um, so we don't want people to just like drive into their parking garage, take the elevator up, go down a double loaded corridor and into their unit. Um, they're not likely to actually connect with anyone if they do that. So we want to create comfortable places to pause and interact, uh, create a circulation that is functional, but also helps people connect. Um, and these are two examples from North Vancouver. So you have the um, Bowline building, which has this great uh, social bike nook area and uh, near their bike storage. It's also functional, but also social. Um, and then the, the outdoor walkways at Keyside Village, which are just like one, <laughs> wonderful, magical places to walk along. Um, activation. So we really want to create a heart or center for the community, a place that people know they can go to and connect with their neighbors. Um, thinking about diverse scales of common spaces um, with intentional things to see and do and providing multiple reasons for people to visit us. Um, so this is the common house at Drickford Village co-housing. Again, they've co-located this with their courtyard. They have a kids' playroom. Um, all of these great spaces, but you can see there's lots of happening in the space. It's really inclusive, it's open, um, and it, it serves members of all, all ages um, who are living in their community. Um, inclusion, so we want to create spaces that are accessible and safe for people of all ages and abilities, um, and also reflecting cultural preferences and identities. Um, so these are two examples from North Van. Uh, we found people in North Van living in these buildings were, were very active. So here we have a special uh, stroller and bike trailer parking, um, which is super important for North Van. And then on the, the right, we, we saw there was a lot of pet owners in North Vancouver. Um, so this building has actually designated a night, um, a day of the week where pets can actually come and enjoy the rooftop patio. Um, and then we also, one thing that's really important in multi-unit housing is allowing people a sense of privacy. And you don't want to feel like you're always having to connect with people, but you need opportunities to retreat. So thinking really carefully about how we're transitioning between public and private spaces. 
Um, so this is the exterior walkways at Driftwood Village Co-housing. Um, you can see these are really well thought out. Um, they have the active circulation elements with the stairs and the views of the courtyards. And they have these kind of like transition zones where there's little seating nooks and um, places to you know leave your scooter, put a little bench. Um, there's windows so you can see if your neighbors are home. Um, all these things interact together to create a more social atmosphere. And, and these outdoor circulation spaces are really important for interaction. Um, and finally, evolution. So we really want to allow people to have a sense of belonging and personalization and stewardship in these spaces, um, allowing them to evolve over time. Um, and these are two examples from, from Driftwood Village co-housing again, some really interesting space for the kids activity room and a workshop. Um, and I'm getting to the end of my slides, so I'll speed up. Um, so really the goal of this research was for other municipalities to learn from what North Van did. Um, so, you know, what we've, you can see the outcomes in the final report, but there were lots of innovative built examples of active design features that we were able to look at. Um, residents who lived in these buildings shared really positive experiences of connection. Um, architects also expressed that they liked the flexibility um, in the guidelines and allowed for new design approaches. Developers also really liked the FSR exclusions um, that they received for many in social spaces. Um, and then future work, we will continue hopefully to work with the City of North Vancouver um, on their next version of the policy. So encouraging uptake in social housing to make sure that you know people of all tenure and income levels are um, benefiting from this. And then um, you know expanding the kind of follow-up research that we can do to make sure that the implementation is equitable across different um, residents. And uh, yeah, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Um, and I'll pass it over to Carla. Um, she's going to share an example of how her team really builds community, both through the process of how they develop housing and the actual design of their housing. Thank you, Madeline, and hello, everyone. My name is Carla Guerrera, and I'm the CEO and founder of Purpose Driven Development. Um, I'll share with you a bit about our company, but we're development management consultants, and uh, we work with a number of groups in the delivery of mixed use, mixed income projects. And we are honored to and acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the, um, the territories of the, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Next slide, please. So our, I, my background is in private sector. I worked for over 25 years in delivering um, over $2 billion in private sector development. And then in 2016, I started Purpose Driven Development. And our mandate is that we unlock potential to create communities where we all can thrive. So we really focus on, next slide, please. Just a bit of my background, next slide, please. And we have a team of development managers and project managers and finance experts um, with a focus on working with nonprofits, First Nations, governments um, to unlock the potential of their land uh, to deliver mixed use, mixed income projects. Next. Next slide. And really with the background that, that we bring from the rigorous kind of proven approaches of private sector, we bring that expertise in working with groups who have land but don't do development as their primary business. Um, so we bring that development lens, that development expertise to unlock the potential of their land, simplify the complexity um, in the development delivery, uh, reduce risk, uh, unlock potential fully from a triple bottom line uh, perspective. So we're looking at optimizing social equity in the projects we deliver. We're looking at optimizing environmental sustainability, but all grounded in financial viability of the projects that we deliver. Next. And so in terms of what we do, um, we work with groups as early as, um, you know, looking at the entire portfolio. We're working with a church group right now that has 60 sites and isn't sure exactly, you know, how to prioritize um, the redevelopment of those lands or what to do to, with them. So we start really early and we will do like an entire portfolio analysis. Um, we also do a lot of land development with, with First Nations who are looking to you know, optimize the, the delivery of development on their lands, whether it's for cultural or 
um, economic or social or, uh, benefit. Um, and then we get into site specific development projects. So we'll do a real estate strategy, development feasibility, and then development management through all phases of development and construction to deliver projects. And then below that, we secure financing as well with all of the various governments and social equity lenders that we have relationships with. Next. So just some of our projects are, are shown here. Um, next slide. So one of the projects we're delivering is a 700 unit affordable mixed income housing project at Cambian Marine. It's a transit oriented development on a, quite a large site that's owned by the Kiwanis Seroptimus Partnership. Next. Uh, we also are delivering um, some really innovative projects that are housing and economic development and cultural space with First Nations. Next. Uh, next. And the project that we are going to speak about, um, which is in construction right now at Cambian 13th in Vancouver, is a really unique project. It's the first of its kind for sure in North America and possibly globally um, in that it is delivering affordable housing for all for women. Um, but we're also delivering it by an all women team to demonstrate the leadership of women across design development and construction where women are very underrepresented. So it's a unique in terms of the what that we're delivering in this project. Uh, and we'll speak about that in terms of how we've integrated social connections and social inclusivity into all aspects of the project decisions. But it's also very unique in the how we're delivering it in that we're elevating um, social equity and the leadership of women uh, where women are very underrepresented in the delivery of, of development and construction. So it's it's kind of hitting hitting the social equity lens on both the how and, and the what. Next. So the project is owned by Seroptimist International of Vancouver, which is a nonprofit organization that is focused on delivering scholarships and education to improve the lives of women and girls. And it just happened that this organization in the 60s, actually at a time when women were not even allowed to have mortgages, if you can believe it, um, the founders of the local chapter purchased um, this site at Cambian 13. And you know, like many nonprofits who are looking to develop their lands, they, the building was aging, had huge maintenance cost, and they hired us to help them create a real estate strategy in terms of what they would do with this site when you know they aren't a developer and, and real estate isn't their primary focus. It's really around their, their scholarships and education supporting women and girls. So we sat down with them and we co-created a vision about delivering housing for uh, women um, primarily focusing on senior women, women-led families, and workforce women. The idea is that this would be an intergenerational housing development for women um, to support, uh, to create a community of women who would support each other um, and deal with issues around social isolation that we know, you know, many senior women face and many single mothers face. So the idea of co-creating um, this project uh, that provides that intergenerational component was a really big driver in the vision. And the other part of the vision that we created together was to elevate women in the delivery of the project by uh, hiring an all woman team across every discipline um, of, the, of the development team that we would be hiring to, to deliver this project. So the result is um, this building that you see here, I'll go into some of the details around the elements of this that are delivering on social connection and addressing social um, inclusivity, but the project itself is delivering 135 new rental homes um, that are mixed between studio and three bedrooms, and it's a mixed income rental level, so it's all affordable, but mixed um, income levels of, of rent, some very deep subsidy and some are um, just below, just below um, like 20% below market rents in the area. Next. 
So this is our team. Um, again, really innovative um, that we were able to kind of hire uh, the lead rock star within across each discipline. Every um, discipline that we hired across the project um, was either a principal in their firm or an owner in their firm. We we're very selective about who, who we brought on. We wanted to showcase the leadership of women. Um, so this was the team uh, and the project is now in construction. We're working with LEDCOR and even LEDCOR is the general contractor has women leads on the, the project management. Um, so they're really using the project to elevate women in construction. Although, I mean, we certainly know this won't be an all women team through construction. It's just not possible this, this yet. Next. So some of the vision and priorities that were established early for this project with our client and our team were to um, you know, create a design approach for women, um, that would enhance the neighborhood. Uh, we were really focused on creating social connections and creating social inclusivity within the building. All of the program and design decisions reflect that. Uh, we wanted to create spaces for education. The whole building is, um, is focused on and has targets uh, beyond what's required around accessibility. Um, affordability obviously has been a, a key priority here. And we wanted to create a community of support for all women uh, within this building and really foster, create a, a space, spaces that would foster that community of support. Uh, environmental sustainability, equity, safety, well-being, peace of mind, and then diversity within the community. So that intergenerational component. And I will say that every one of these vision and priority principles that we established early has been reflected and, and driven every uh, decision on the project. So these are some of the renderings. Um, you can see the far, uh, the entrance that you see on the right there. Um, this entrance to the building has seating spaces, bike parking, it's open. It really engages with the street. So that space itself and how we design the entrance is really meant to create that interaction with the neighborhood and foster spaces where people can have those informal discussions and connections that Madeline was speaking about. Next. Um, so as I said, we planned and designed the entire building and all the decisions to foster social connection. So one of those decisions was the rooftop patio. So you can see the, the rooftop area. In most projects, these spaces with sweeping views across the city would be reserved for the highest rent levels. In our case, we kept it completely open to all the residents of the building and have spaces programmed for um, indoor amenity rooms, education space, co-working space, um, yoga rooms, and then all of this outdoor patio area has been programmed for um, you know, various uses and seating areas for all of the residents of the building. Next. The other thing that we did is we designed um, amenity spaces on the ground floor, like the lobby has been designed as a large living room for the entire building where, you know, a single mom coming home from work with her kids might bump into a senior who lives in the building who is feeling isolated and wanting to have those connections. So there's a large kind of living room um, feel to the lobby with a very large couch um, where those informal connections can be made. And the other thing that we did is we know that for seniors, um, the laundry room is often the only time that some senior seniors that we know of are going to be having social connections. So we also designed the laundry room as a social space and connected it directly to the outdoor areas where, you know, there are natural play areas and a Zen garden and lounge areas. So um, using these functional spaces as spaces to be designed for social connection, to foster and create opportunities for social connection was really intentional. Next. Uh, next. Next slide. So I'm just gonna wrap up here. I see Connie. Um, so I do wanna mention that, um, you know, some of the best practices or the lessons learned around how we, um, how, you know, municipalities can really think about supporting uh, the creation of buildings like this that are delivering on social connection as well as affordability. 
So some of our experience was, were that we, in working with the city of Vancouver, uh, there was a lot of leniency on municipal policies. So in order for us to achieve the level of affordability that we achieved, we needed a lot of flexibility here in terms of setbacks, um, height, that type of thing was really, really, really key to create these additional spaces within the building for social connection. Also, um, flexibility on restrictive zoning and height requirements was really uh, critical. Um, we did have some barriers with the city of Vancouver on that with the view corridors, we had to lose some height we had intended. Uh, we also received expedited approvals. We got rezoning on this project from the city of Vancouver in seven and a half months, which was exceptional um, and helped to, again, um, you know, ensure that there was um, not additional cost with lengthy approvals timelines. Next. Fee waivers, we received a lot of fee waivers um, from the city as well as um, from TransLink um, and DCC and DCL fee waivers, which are, again are essential to ensure you can create additional spaces for social connection within these buildings by those cost savings. Uh, I think I'm just gonna leave it there because I think I'm a little bit over time here. Thank you so much. So just want to provide our contact info in case anyone would like to get in touch or speak about any opportunities, we'd be really happy to connect with you. Thank you. Connie, you're muted. Thank you so much, Carla, Madeline, and Michelle. We're delighted that we heard so many key concepts about this that really change uh, how housing, how we look at housing, and really um, insightful points that people can definitely go back to on this recording. And what we'd like to do is now turn it over to the questions that have been coming in. We're really excited that there's been several questions coming forward. Um, and again, I'll first turn it over to our special guest, uh, Mayor Linda Buchanan from City of North Vancouver. And one of our tough questions, and the whole panel can come on, but I'll give it to <laughs> Linda first, <laughs> put you on the hot seat. Okay. Um, some of these key social connection spaces are within the building, the lobby, the staircase, and outside design guidelines. How is North Vancouver supporting and recommending this for the rest? Because it's so key. Uh, well, thank you very much, Connie, and thank you so much uh, for uh, planning this and uh, for Plan H for planning this and, and having us come together. If, if my panelists can come on as well. Um, I do want to um, just acknowledge that I am meeting um, from the traditional territories uh, and ancestral territories of the Squamish and Slay with Tooth Nations. And I really want to actually raise my hand to all these women who are on the panel um, because I know all of them. I know the work that they do and the leadership that they have in advancing uh, social connectivity and the amount of work that they do to raise and lift up women is extraordinary. Um, so it's an honor to be here with them. Um, in terms of the city of North Vancouver, I, I think what I'll just go back a little bit, Connie, in the sense of this was actually, so for those who may not know me or read my bio, um, I have a 30 year career in public health. So I spent 30 years as a public health nurse working with children and families and community and in health promotion and prevention, uh, really around um, uh, school health and, and really elevating uh, social connections as well as activity with children in particular. Um, and so when I became a counselor, it was kind of a natural, uh, for any other nurses out there, uh, public life is service is uh, a natural fit for nurses who particularly who do public health. And um, so I brought this notice of motion after reading an article on the, the design guidelines, active design guidelines that came out of New York. Um, and so I'd spent a lot of time initially, as I said, with working with children, particularly around um, active, active routes to school in my public health life. But when I came to council, it was interesting because people would say to me, well, you're not a nurse anymore, and which I was, and you're not on the board of education anymore. And I was like, uh, I'm not, but as a municipality, we are 
uh, we oversee land use, we oversee um, built environment, that all leads to the places and spaces that children and families and people within our community go to. So we have uh, a role uh, to play in this, in this. And so I brought the notice of motion to say, we really need to look at um, not just the built environment in, in all of our public spaces, but how do we actually look at the built env environment that we have control over the land use. And some of the design guidelines may not be within our purview, but we have the ability over zoning bylaws to make changes on how uh, developers and architects are looking at their buildings and how do we enhance the that livability and in increase the activity, but also those abilities for people to be able to socially connect. So that was back in 2014, I think was the notice. 2015 was staff came with the guidelines with changes to our zoning, to our zoning bylaws, which I uh, can get people access to those if you want to see the report. Um, and it was really about not being prescriptive, but having a list in terms of things that our staff could be talking with developers and architects as they were in that initial planning process of how we could enhance this, um, including how do we as a local government, when we're looking at our own civic buildings, how do we incorporate this into our own into our own buildings? So if you come into our city hall, the staircase is uh, a main feature. If you go into our library, it's right there. If you look at Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, the Hope Center in the city of North Vancouver, the staircase is actually visible to the street. So if you take the stairs, you actually also then get to see outside and people can see you. So there's a lot more so uh, connectivity to the outside world um, or the outside street. Um, and so how do we incorporate these into not just private spaces, but into public uh, infrastructure as well? And so I'm really actually pleased that the research that's been done and, and the outcomes that um, that this, uh, Michelle and Madeline have, have brought forward through working with the residents, because it allows us to actually go back and take a look to see what's worked, what hasn't worked, how do we adapt uh, how do we adapt our um, our zoning bylaws? How can we improve them? And really, it is a conversation, as I said, for our staff to be having with developers and and uh, landscape architectures, et cetera, to look at how we're designing the entire space and adding suggestions on making these more livable. Fifty percent of my residents live in multifamily buildings. Um, so it is incredibly important that we try to incorporate as much as we can as we look to see more development happening with the provincial legislation. When we look to see what some of these buildings may end up looking like, I think this is a really good opportunity to have more and more conversations about how do we make sure we don't lose the essence of what we need to be incorporating into these buildings for the sake of just building buildings. Like it isn't just about the building, it's how we actually are are putting this whole, all the pieces together to provide the much needed housing, but that is livable, allows for connectivity, allows for um, activity. I'll leave it at that and let my colleagues uh, add into that if they wish. I don't know, Carla, if we wanna put it over to you, you showed some samples of what you've done to build connections. Thank you, Linda. Um, it's really helpful to have that background from North Vancouver as well to situate and have the context. And we have a number of questions coming in, but maybe Carla will let Yeah, I can, I'll well. come in and um, like from, I've spent sort of half of my career delivering projects, including a project um, where I worked with Linda at the city of North Van, um, a private sector development project and half of my career now kind of working in the uh, non-market housing space. And I think one of the things that I will say is it's um, it's much easier to do what we're talking about today in the, in the private sector space than it is to do in the non-market housing space. And I think like for city people, planners and staff and politicians, I think it's really important um, for everyone to really understand that because creating spaces um, 
you know, creating spaces that don't generate any kind of revenue at all. So like the bigger lobby, the bigger laundry room, um, though every square foot, every, every additional cost per square foot or every additional amenity that you build into a project has to be covered off in terms of the project revenue. And so when you're layering that into an affordable housing project like ours, it becomes a really, really difficult thing to do while maintaining the, the deepest level of affordability you can. You have to, that cost has to come from somewhere to pay for those non-revenue generating spaces. But for market developments, it's there's a lot more, there's a lot more room to maneuver. And so I would say from a policy perspective, you know, my recommendation to cities would be you know, there's a lot more flexibility and room with with market development to actually layer these requirements on in terms of creating spaces for social connection, whether they're interior or exterior spaces, than they are for affordable housing projects where, you know, you're trying to deepen affordability and, and they're almost a bit at odds. It's a much more challenging exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. That's uh, helpful to just think of different perspectives in the business sector and the, the private public sector, as well as, you know, the, the government municipalities really looking at what they can do and what are the negotiated pieces. And I know that uh, having an opportunity to come to the uh, sessions that were hosted by Madeline and Michelle it was uh, the toolkit that was coming out. So I don't know if you wanted to speak to one of the questions that came in and thank you to the audience for posting some fabulous questions that we have coming in. Um, what were your hopes for the toolkit and what was the benefit for bringing together the six jurisdictions to have this conversation over four times? I don't know if you want to speak to that. Madeline and Michelle, I'll throw that out to you. Madeline, how about you take the first part and I'll take the second. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I think the idea really came from one thing that Michelle and I have been trying to do for years is get these kind of cross-sectoral dialogues going. So it's so important for, you know, everyone to talk to each other. Um, and it's often the case, right? Architects and planners don't visit the buildings that they approved or, or designed. Um, residents don't get, get opportunities to give that feedback. Um, and, you know, municipalities don't always talk to each other, right? Everyone is really busy. They're all working on really similar goals, but kind of in their own corners. Um, so we thought, let's see if they'll come together and actually um, work together. One thing is obviously like developers and architects across the region do work across different municipalities. So it's nice to have some kind of um, alignment and, and harmonization and agreement on like, what is good amenity space? Um, because right now there is no agreement across, you know, all six of those jurisdictions. Um, the other thing is that they all have unique challenges, so different population sizes, different demographics. So there is a lot of like interlearning opportunities to say like, hey, we're doing this thing, it's working really well. Um, and you know, it sparked a lot of ideas um, in planners' heads of like, hey, we could do that too. Um, the other benefit was that they were all coming together to learn um, and you know, setting the whole day aside to, to learn about these things. We were able to bring in lots of different guests. Like we had Carla come in and talk about her project. So they were able to to kind of get a really rich experience rather than like all trying to curate this, this by themselves. Um, maybe Michelle, I'll let you add to that. Yeah, no, I think you covered that well. I I, I just like to think, for example, of um, uh, you know, one of the larger municipalities we're working with I said in the third workshop, like, oh, if we're gonna if we're gonna deal with the 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 massive amount of provincial legislation coming down. And our, you know, and our OCP and all of this, we need to keep working together across departments, right? So it wasn't only planner from jurisdiction A talking to planners from jurisdiction B. It was planners just from their own jurisdictions working, you know, across their own silos, right? The the seniors planner with the development permit person and the social planner and the OCP people and the long range planner, like they don't often get an opportunity to really sit down and and kind of like chew on this stuff together so that's that's big and then in terms of like how um the toolkit so we're basically kind of assembling all the material we assembled for planners for these four workshops um you know case studies on uh you know best uh design principles examples um policies from elsewhere um, and we'll pull it together in something that we hope is you know quite useful and accessible to other um local governments across bc and canada uh, and hopefully it's a starting point for others to think about similar policy directions. 
Um, and yeah, hopefully it's an inspiration. And, you know, as uh, the jurisdictions we're working with actually enact policy, you know, we hope to kind of follow, you know, follow them through to that and, and kind of talk about what they're learning to and, and what, what approach they took, because we do want to see, you know, harmonization, but we're not expecting every um, government to come up with exactly the same, you know, policies, incentives, strategies, whatnot. I think there's going to be lots of um, differentiation, but some common principles and, and approaches. Yeah, and we just recognize it as as a time to to you know throw out a lot of our old assumptions about housing. Right, there is so much change happening from the provincial level, you know, announcements from the federal level. Um, everyone knows that we need to do things differently, and you know there are so many success stories of more efficient processes that are more inclusive, more equitable, leading to these really great community outcomes. So, how do we mainstream those? How can we you know learn from them? You know, not everyone is going to live in co-housing, but um, there's things we can learn from co-housing about how they relate to each other and how they, you know, manage their building that we can bring into rental housing, for example. I think if I can add to that, I, I think it is, uh, and I might have said it earlier, just in terms of good timing in the sense of this research and the toolkit, as particularly in British Columbia, as we look at all the new legislation coming, and if we look at you know, standardize, standardization of buildings, um, no lot lines, no parking, um, and how how is the government defining parking? Because if we look at the research, one of the common spaces that people, amenity spaces people use is the parkade. Now for many uh, in, you know, when we look at Driftwood, it's a lot of parking of, you'd be shocked. I've been down there. The number of um, cargo bikes, bikes uh, which exceed the number of cars, um, but those are the spaces that people are connecting. And so really looking at having those conversations across disciplines and across um, not just within departments within City Hall, but the disciplines that are all part of the process of building housing. Um, you know, we have to start having these conversations across all, all the different sectors just as we start to build. So because we have examples of what is working well we have things that can be improved upon. And so as we launch into this next phase of building, as I said, we really, you know, it isn't just for the sake of building housing. These are going to be people's homes. And so how do we really use the best use of, of funding? And particularly as Carla mentioned, for the non-market housing, it's harder to do. But I would also encourage my senior levels of government to be looking at you know, they, they need to actually be investing perhaps a little bit more in us, not just talking about how much per unit. It is about a building and people's homes. And what is that return on investment in terms of not just their home, but the other spaces that are required within the buildings uh, to support the people who are in their livability um, and their social connectiveness. That return on investment is significant you know, in the long term, if we don't, because mm -hmm. we're paying it somewhere else down the line for people who are very lonely, or uh, not connected, or not given getting that activity. And so those conversations have to take place. And government, we're not so great at doing that in terms of that return on investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's you, such Linda, a connecting it. It's such a it's such a good point, Linda, I think, yeah, you know, when we go to the lenders or BC Housing and, and talk about, you know, the projects, it's always, and with this project I presented today, you know, it's a, it's a cost per unit. It's coming in higher. It's a cost per unit coming in higher. Um, and there's very little, uh, you know, willingness to, to negotiate beyond the benchmark, but to do what, what we showed you today, you know, there is a cost to do that. There's a cost in time. There's a cost in fees. There's a cost in hard costs as well. Um, but I, I do also expanding on that, like the way we look at our projects is this just isn't another building. This is, you know, you have one chance to get it right with every building you build. You have one chance to get it right. And then that is that result lasts for 50, 60 years, whatever the life of the building yeah. is. And so you really need to even in like the approvals, like you have one chance to get the project yeah. right. So it's worth making that investment in time, energy and effort. And the final thing I'll say just on that is when we look at, you know, even, you know, we look at what Madeline and, and Michelle presented with the with the examples and we look at our project, 
there is a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum in terms of cost and intensity of, you know, creating a whole amenity space or extra space that has a certain cost to it and requires a certain amount of design. There's also really simple things like just simple interventions, like a bench out of the, the front entrance or, you know, the materiality of the entrance. So I think when we think about these things, we can look at them on a spectrum. And, you know, I, from my perspective, having worked in public and private and nonprofit housing delivery for many decades now, there isn't a single reason why a project can't achieve something on that spectrum. It's all yeah. just intention. It's intention yeah. and yeah. commitment. Yeah. And, and just... those goals that you had at the beginning, I, I think I'll look to wrap up. Michelle, you had one word to add there. And I oh, uh, yeah, wrap I was, up I was... at this point. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to build that just really quickly on what Carla and, and Linda said just about um, you know, the importance of getting it right, right? We, we're, we're about to build, you know, a lot of <laughs> supply with, you know, but finally provincial and federal governments really, you know, coming to the table um, and, and, and changing legislation too to make this yeah, happen faster. Yeah. And so it's really important that we do more than just build, you know, walls and, and roofs. Like this, this is critical, essential infrastructure. It's economic infrastructure. It's health infrastructure. It's safety infrastructure. It's social infrastructure. It's all of these things. Um, and so I think we do, we will do the future a disservice. We will do our future selves, our kids, our grandkids, uh, and, and new, new arrivals to Canada, we will do all of ourselves a disservice if we think of it as anything less than that. So thank you to all of you. It's been a great uh, conversation and I'm sorry to cut it short at this point, but we do have a promise to send out all of the um, questions and in a two to three weeks, a video uh, link to this on our YouTube channel and going into answering the questions from the chat that we didn't get to. Uh, so we will mission to put that. And if you have other questions, you can add them into your survey um, at the end. If you uh, call to action here, speak to our Plan H and BCHC team. Stay tuned for more webinars. And uh, coming soon, anticipated soon, our age-friendly and Plan H grant applications um, to continue the good work and to take it to the next step. Thank you, Monica. Next slide. Some takeaways today, we do have a resource page. So all of the resources that were in the chat, uh, links to Happy Cities, Hey Neighbor, and to um, Purpose Driven Development, we have that as well as some other policy levers um, that were pr provided by the government. Uh, today's webinar will be uploaded. And again, we have more resources on our websites as well as the other websites you saw. Um, and last slide, we just want to say thank you. Here is a list of everyone's contact information if you'd like to reach out um, to everyone that's been on the panel here to ask a specific connection. We're looking forward to uh, thanking you, each one of you personally, uh, with a card that will follow up. And thank you so much to the audience for joining us today. Um, we love to have opportunities to serve the communities in a great way, and especially as you've made the points about housing, how important it is that it lasts a, a very long time for people and that this is their home. So really trying to get it right. And so thank you uh, for co-housing and social connections, which is really one of the goals and uh, mission statements of BC Healthy Communities. So thank you for being here today. Thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll say farewell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank so much.